Hey, Hush Small Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hits and tips in dentistry. And today is a special day if you're seeing this. What I've just recently learned on partial extraction therapy. Now, if you don't know anything about partial extraction therapy, fret not, neither did I. Until I follow, started following this gentleman, Mark Bashara, and this is going to be this, uh, he's actually given us, this is a course that he's created. He's given us pretty much 90% of the course you're going to watch uh, on this YouTube channel. But really what happened was about two years ago, I started following what he founded, the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network. Um, so I noticed that he's into a lot of partial extraction therapy. Now, there's 13, almost 14,000 people on this Facebook page, and there's a lot of different great stuff on here in partial extraction therapy. So if you don't know what that is, essentially it's extracting, partially extracting teeth, leaving the buccal plate, and then leaving the buccal portion of the tooth and then placing your implant. But in this video, he actually goes through a lot of the different, more detailed techniques and things to think about uh, as you plan this. So I'm not going to talk much about it. I'm grateful to Dr. Bashar for sharing with us. And as a thank you to him, if you could join uh, the Implant Dentistry Network and, you know, just send him a thank you. So, you know, you saw this in All Things Dentistry, uh, his partial extraction therapy uh, series or the lecture. So without further ado, Dr. Mark Bashara. Welcome everybody to the online partial extraction therapy program. I'm very happy to be bringing you this program in conjunction with Dr. Jorge Campos, who has written an excellent ebook as well on this topic. Chapter one begins with what we consider a paradigm shift in implant dentistry. So first we need to look at the definitions. Partial extraction therapy encompasses three things, the socket shield technique, root submergence technique, and the pontic shield technique. Socket shield technique is what we employ in placement of our implants. The root submergence technique involves burying the roots only. The pontic shield technique is a variation of the socket shield technique in which implants are not being placed. The technique dates back to 2010 under the Herzler group and as well the Mitzius group in 2006. We know that total tooth extraction leads to some level of bone loss, especially when we consider the bundle bone and the buccal cortical plate. And this is shown from the works of Arujo and Linde. Rather than removing the entire tooth, a buccal fragment of the tooth is left in place. And this is done on purpose. The implant is placed in the paddle or lingual aspect of this fragment, what we call the shield. This implant can be in contact or not in contact with the retained root, but it's very important that you don't have any root mobility. This technique dates back to 2010. It's become wider and wider in use with spectacular results from clinicians throughout the world. In the short term, we know that when we extract the tooth, the PDL comes with it. This ligament is composed of fibers and blood vessels that feed into the dense bone, forming the buccal cortical plate. The bone is naturally nourished through this vascularization provided by the bone marrow and the periosteum. So it's become very clear that the blood supply to the periodontium is more important than the blood supply that's provided by the periosteum. In the medium term, over the years, researchers have shown that there's a number of failures in case that initially seem to be quite successful. We see, especially on CBCT scans, that an implant can be halfway out of the bone and functioning without issue. And is this the fault of the oral surgeon that placed the implant incorrectly, or was the implant placed correctly and something has changed over time? And there's a number of consequences that come with this. You can get gingival retraction, you can get buccal defects, you can get shine through or transparent color of the implant, showing through the tissue. It can also lead to a cascade of peri-implantitis complications. So some complications like I'm showing here include tissue retraction. You can get the shine through the titanium showing through the tissue. You can get a depression or buccal collapse, eventual peri-implantitis. Why is this technique used and why is it so useful? We can see that these implants do not have any bone present in the buccal area. It looks like these implants were placed incorrectly. What really happened here? These were immediate implants. They were placed in the same day that the teeth were replaced. So the extraction here uh, occurred and the buccal plate was very thin. And over time from function and musc muscular tension, we ended up with bone resorption and having a very 
thin or non-existent buccal plate. By maintaining the periodontium, the vascularity of the keratinized gingiva is also maintained. When we extract a root, we lose not only the alveolar bone, but also that vascularity of the periodontium providing nourishment to the gingival margin. What do we normally do? Normally in type 1 sockets, which are sockets with intact buccal and lingual plates, implants are placed and we are filling the gap with a biomaterial of choice. Typically, we're also adding a connective tissue graft from the tuberosity or palate to thicken the, the tissue or also change the biotype from thin to thick. There's a learning curve to this, including extra morbidity factors that come into play. So what does the literature say? We know from the works of Chapuis, we know from the works of Benick, that the thin buccal plate in most of these cases is less than one millimeter in thickness. And there's an interesting study here by Benick where they took a radiopaque resin and took a CBCT of the area to show how thin the buccal plates were in place. And it showed that 65% of the implants had a buccal cortical plate. The remaining 35% had no buccal cortical plate at all as shown in this image. So what to do? Preservation of the buccal plate depends on its thickness. The analysis of socket wall dimensions in the upper maxilla showed that most cases, actually 87% of cases, had a socket thickness of one millimeter or less. So this is a big problem, especially in the aesthetic zone. So this is where the socket shield technique comes into play, and we're going to discuss that next in Beginning with chapter two, the socket shield technique. The socket shield technique first begins with a horizontal cut, and this is the first surgical step that you're going to employ. You're going to want to use a diamond at high speed to do this cut. And you're going to want to ensure that this cut is made above the gingiva to avoid damaging any tissue. The purpose of the horizontal cut is, is that it makes it easier for the subsequent steps after, which is the vertical cut. And this vertical cut is going to happen in a critical manner in such a way that you ensure that you do not damage the adjacent teeth or the bone as well. The vertical cut comes next. Starting with the vertical cut, you're going to use a long shank round and diamond burr. Again, in high speed, beginning from the center of the pulp chamber towards the mesial and distal sides. Like I mentioned, you're going to want to ensure that you perform this in a controlled manner and avoiding damaging any papilla or interproximal bone. The clinician should be very careful to look directly at the tooth in case it's rotated. So the cut should be parallel to the buccal cortical plate and not exactly mesodistal because every tooth will have a different anatomy. You're going to begin with the same long shank round and, round and diamond that you used and continue with the bone cutter burr. So on the side here, this is the bone cutter through Comet Dental, and you can check out different suppliers that can carry this locally. One of the easiest teeth to cut is the upper first premolar. Naturally, this happens because it has buccal and paddle roots separating from each other. So the long shank round diamond burr is the most commonly used instrument in this case. This is a tip before conducting the cuts to full depth is to use an endophile and this can be used to take a, a measurement on the x-ray to verify prior to going to length. And this length can be then transferred to your long shank burr by marking it with a permanent marker. Make sure that your cuts are first superficial and then going to full depth till you hit the apex next. This is a very nice illustration that again reinforces those concepts. So it's very important to obtain CBCT for these cases to an analyze the root um, basically trajectory and see what kind of angulation that you're going to be following because this can vary, especially in the anterior maxilla quite often. After the vertical cut is performed, the paddle or lingu lingual segment is going to be removed next. Typically, you're going to be using a periotome to section the PDL fibers you can use a straight elevator that's narrow to luxate the extraction fragment next. It's important to note that if you notice any shield movement or loosening, 
that the socket shield procedure should be aborted and you should basically go back to regular extraction and placement of your implant and filling the gap or performing GBR if necessary. Once the root is cut, it's important to measure so that we know that the implant length corresponds to what the root shape looks like. Uh, keep in mind, you're going to have taken CBCT ahead of time. So you should have an idea ahead of time what kind of implant you're placing, but it helps to have these extra figures and numbers by analyzing the root length that you have removed off the paddle aspect. It's also important to conduct a second radiograph after cutting the root and separating the shield. You want to ensure that you've removed all remnants of any gutta perca or anodontic cement if the root was treated previously. So here's a nice case illustrating an upper first premolar and removal of the paddle segment. We have now raised the mini flap in place and we'll talk about that next in order to level the shield to the crest and implant is placed. Next, we're going to look at the upper edge prep. So the bevel is one of the most important aspects of treatment, which leads to our next question. At what height should we leave the gingival edge of the socket shield? So there are three philosophies in, in play, and we're going to go over each one of these. First being leaving the area below the gingival sulcus, but still supracrestal. So this means that the shield is going to be above your bone level. Second is having the shield at crest. Third is having the shield subcrestal. So level one, so basically it's below tissue, but supracrestal. So the theory is that there's one millimeter of epithelial attachment and another millimeter of connective tissue attachment that happens to the roots. And this is a space that has dental gingival fibers. And these fibers help to maintain the architecture of the gingiva. So if we're going to plan to keep our shield at this level, we're going to use instruments to help retract and protect the tissue from damage. And you can see in place that we're protecting the tissue here with various instruments in play. So the shield is being trimmed to below tissue level, but it's not all the way to the crest in this case. Okay. What is the general consensus? The problem is if you leave your shield above the crest of the bone, you can get external shield exposures. So it's risky to use this level of socket shield. So the general consensus from the first partial extraction therapy meeting in Madrid 2017 is that the margin should be left at level two, which corresponds to leaving the shield at bone level or at the crest of the bone. And we basically implement what we call a mini flap technique as described by Dr. Maurice Salama. So this is what I employ as well. And I find that you do get less shield exposures using this technique. So you're going to employ a small flap and you're going to visualize the socket shield to level it exactly at the level of the crestal bone. So again, you can see here's a case where the partial extraction therapy is going to be performed and you're raising a mini flap, and you're wanting to ensure that the area of the shield is level to the level of the crest, and that way you don't have any chances of shield exposure. As far as subcrestal level, for us, this is not a relevant area that we should be looking at. And the reason being is that you can damage the buckle bone by having the shield prepared below the buckle bone level. So it's not recommended to have the shield below the bone at all in any circumstance for this technique. Most important is the prosthetic space. The internal part of the shield needs to be shaped in such a way such, such that the coronal aspect by about three or four millimeters has enough space for the prosthetics that are designed and also such that the gingiva can grow over the area and have adequate coverage. So this internal bevel is prepared using an oval shaped burr, but you can also use a large round burr as well. And this acts to create prosthetic space for a crown and abutment. So here's a very nice illustration which shows that the shield can be very close to the implant, or you can have up to one to three millimeters of space. And in most cases, it really depends on the kind of dimensions that you have because 
in some cases like a lateral upper incisor or a maxillary central incisor to have that adequate uh, width of the area buccal to lingual can be a challenge so in some cases your shield will be in close proximity to the implant and you're going to have to ensure that you have this beveling effect such that you have adequate space for your prosthetics without having compression of your abutment or crown against the shield and causing potential problems down the road. So ideally space between the shield and the implant will fill with bone. And you can sometimes have soft tissue invading this gap in the most coronal three millimeters. So in this case, we have an image of an ideal shape prep and you'll find that you'll find variations in how each clinician approaches the case and having a preferred way to achieve this goal. So the implants and the shield, what is the relationship between these two? So the implant can either be over the shield at the same level or below. So how do you decide? I find that the best position is to be one or two millimeters below the shield. And why is that again? You're going to ensure that less contact occurs with the peri-implant soft tissues and the coronal part of the implant. The implant can be separated from the shield or remain in contact with the shield depending on which tooth is being replaced. Like I mentioned, in the case of an upper central incisor, for example, if you have buckle to paddle distance of about six millimeters, if your implant is three and a half millimeters, the shield is a millimeter thick, the remaining width between the implant and the shield will be at most one and a half millimeters. So sometimes you don't have the space that you're, uh, you're going to want. So you want to ensure that you apply that bevel to create the prosthetic space needed for the crown and the abutment. What about separation between the shield and the implant? In both cases, if you have contact or not, it's, ensure, it's important to ensure that you leave enough space for that soft tissue when rehabilitating the area to ensure that you have adequate gingival coverage of the shield and avoid internal exposures. So this leads to a very important role of what we consider, uh, which is the implant emergence profile. And we want to ensure that we're taking maximum advantage of this by having the implant at an appropriate level and also designing the case in such a way that we don't have compression against the shield. So here's a nice case illustrating the shield. And after creating the emergence profile in place, we're creating a, an emergence in such a way that it's not going to cause accidental compression against the shield. What about shield width? The width will maintain the, the width of the periodontium. So this also will provide vascularization to the buccal bone of the socket. So this issue is related to the studies carried out by the team of Dr. Herzler. So in 2013, a work led by Dr. Balmer used a canine with a root with a vertical fracture. And the result of separating the root and leaving the two halves showed that this actually maintained the alveolar bone. So in this case here on a molar case, we can see that once the mesial root was taken out, you have a depression in the mesial aspect. 